And she erased the memory of that meltdown back in 2017. Trailing in the polls, Marine Le Pen's got ground to make up when she squares off with Emmanuel Macron in less than two hours' time in the one and only French presidential election candidates debate. It's an exercise that matters in a nation that takes its politics seriously. We'll review what went wrong for the far-right standard bearer on the night back in 2017, whether she's softened her stances, as she claims, and whether the sitting French president can overcome incumbent fatigue or avoid coming across as a know-it-all. More broadly, what's changed in five years? Then, the theme music of the campaign was anxiety over globalization and deindustrialization. Now, that's been compounded by COVID, a cost of living spike, and the added uncertainty of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, with the left split over who and whether to uh, vote. How different is 2022 from 2017? Today in the France 24 debate, we're uh, taking a look at the high-stakes rematch that's uh, going to unfold between Macron and Le Pen. With us, he campaigned for Emmanuel Macron back in 2017. That was then. This is now. Lex Paulson is director of the School of Collective Intelligence at Morocco's Mohammed VI Polytechnic University. Good to be here. You're, 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 you're fresh out of the taxi. <laughs> fresh out of the You rushed in. Ready to debate. Okay. <laughs> Many thanks. Uh, from London, Max Bigon, UK representative for Marine Le Pen's National Rally Party. Welcome to the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, from Exeter, sociologist uh, Charles Masquelier, senior lecturer at uh, the University of Exeter. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we have Frenchmen in England and we have a German in Paris. Political scientist Cornelia Voll, president of the Hertie School of Public Policy in Berlin. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. The uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Uh, they've agreed on the camera angles, the choice of moderators, the room temperature, 19 degrees. Now it's the time. Nicholas Rushworth previews that candidate's debate. Both candidates will want to appear calm and collected for the 2022 TV debate, the opposite of the confusion and tension of five years ago. You are at the front in permanence, in front of Germany, in front of the powers of gold, in front of the banks. Marine Le Pen's team acknowledges she was too aggressive. One of the mistakes to avoid. There's no point getting angry. You have to give a measured response, defend policies and ideas, and show you can be president. One pitfall they will want to avoid is mutual condescension, as in 2017 when they went head to head over details concerning two French companies. You are en train de lire une fiche qui ne correspond pas au dossier que vous avez cité. Il y en a un qui fait des téléphones, et l'autre ça n'a rien à voir. Il fait à la fois des turbines et du matériel industriel. Emmanuel Macron's team realizes he must not come across as superior. It's not arrogant to ask questions at a time as crucial as the presidential debate, to show what's behind the cloak of banalities Marine Le Pen has been hiding behind for weeks. Marine Le Pen, by her own admission, arrived at the 2017 debate feeling tired and poorly prepared. This time I think they've decided to calm down. She'll want to look competent, credible, not lost in her notes and presidential. And he'll want to avoid being seen as arrogant or like he's teaching someone a lesson. <laughs> the duel was electric right up to the last second five years ago. One key difference this time is that Emmanuel Macron will have five years of policy decisions to defend. Well, with one hour and 44 minutes to go, let's cross to uh, La Plaine Saint-Denis, north of Paris, uh, with the television studios where uh, the debate will be taking place. France 24's Claire Pacalin is there. Uh, Claire, any sign of the candidates yet? Not yet, Francois, but the red carpet is firmly in place just behind me, so we are expecting them to arrive anytime soon. They'll have about an hour and a half to prepare backstage before the debate fully kicks off. This is, of course, very high stakes for both candidates. Literally millions of French people will be tuning in tonight. Some of them will be deciding who they'll vote for on Sunday based on the, the performances 
of the candidates. Others will be deciding whether they want to vote at all on Sunday, whether they'll actually decide to cast a ballot in the second round of this presidential election. We know Emmanuel Macron will be trying to come off not arrogant, not aloof, not like a know-it-all. That's some of the criticism he's got here. He has a, a bit of an image problem. Some French people feel that he comes across as a bit of a clever clog. Marine Le Pen will be trying to, of course, improve her performance when compared to 2017. It's known here as a naufrage or a shipwreck, basically a train wreck. Her performance back in 2017, in the just ahead of the second round then, five years ago, she made factual errors. She gave Emmanuel Macron the upper hand quite easily, but she has, of course, done her homework now, and she says herself that she's learned her lessons. Claire Pacalin will be crossing back live to you. Brea, do break in uh, when those candidates uh, arrive. Um, let me begin with you, Lex Paulson. Uh, it's due to last about two hours. These affairs can run over. They have a lot in the past. How does this compare with a U.S. presidential candidate's debate? Uh, well, it's similar in that uh, it's not a debate in the in the conventional sense of a war of ideas. It's a war of frames. And they're not speaking to the same audience, right? So I think Marine Le Pen actually, in a way, has the easier frame that she wants to present. Either you are for a president of proximité, pouvoir d'achat, you know, closeness to the people or and the, and the purchasing power, or you're for the global elite, which she thinks that Macron represents. That's an easy frame for her. It's something that she's pushed uh, very, very uh, consistently through this campaign. Macron has a tougher task. What kind of frame uh, can he put that's going to be convincing to his audience, which are the left-wing voters of, of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who are the, the largest sum of voters up for grabs uh, on Sunday? Uh, he can't really get uh, to her left on economic issues. Um, so it's really either Europe or climate. Now, he made a very strong speech on climate this week. Uh, and he can, I think, convincingly say Marine Le Pen is the end of the fight against climate change, the dismantling of, of wind farms, et cetera, the, the, the exit of France from the Paris Accords. Um, that's, that could work. The other thing that is, uh, he is for Europe that moves ahead and it stands strong against Russia, and she is Russia's best friend in France. Those are the two frames, I think, that would be the most successful to him. We'll see if he tries it. And Max Begon, where will uh, Marine Le Pen press? Max Begon, can you hear us? Uh, sorry, I, di I didn't hear. Uh, where, what was your question? I'm sorry. Where, it's not where will going Marine well Le, 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 Le Pen be, be putting the accent? Well, I think uh, it's a great opportunity for Marine Le Pen to take a look at the five years of presidency of Emmanuel Macron, who was elected on a platform of uh, economic improvement, which, which he failed to deliver with uh, an average growth, rate, which was well below the OECD average and actually well below the growth under US President Trump. Um, you know, he was a man that was pictured as a, someone who changed French politics. And uh, it turned out that uh, lots of his ministers had to resign for various uh, investigations from the judiciary. So um, he has escaped debate for, for most of the campaign. And, and finally, we have a chance to get a debate with him. So we're really looking forward to, to that and the French people, I think, as well. It went horribly bad. Marine Le Pen said so herself back in 2017. What will she do differently? Well, I think she, she had learned a lot. And um, it's clear that even though she had a passion for France and she was really feeling in her heart what she was saying, uh, in that kind of debate, it, it, it is better to, to stay calm and to just you know look coldly at the what Emmanuel Macron has achieved over five years, it, it should be well enough to, to convince the French and also, you know, to explain her project, which has been developed over now a decade and has come to fruition and is very mature. Here we are between the two rounds, and we're seeing how uh, it's now a focus much more on the issues. There were a lot of people complaining that because of COVID, because of the war in Ukraine, we didn't have much of a campaign uh, leading up to the first round. Now the focus is squarely there. And what we're seeing is Marine Le Pen losing ground. Uh, Emmanuel Macron's lead climbing to 13 points, according uh, to our daily Ipsos uh, tracking poll. And the lead has widened since uh, the uh, Sunday night, April the 10th, and the uh, results came in from that first round. Uh, Charles Masquelier, uh, your, your thoughts, what can a debate change? 
Oh, well, um, it really depends on the context for sure. It also depends um, on really what goes on during the debate. But clearly, it can change the mind of voters that tend to be somewhat undecided. Um, that's usually what a debate does um, and does quite well. Now, uh, what it might do is reinforce people's positions, people's kind of voting decisions already. Uh, but it can, it can potentially also, who knows, sometimes change the mind. If someone performs particularly badly, for example, that could happen. Um, and I wonder whether that might have happened with Le Pen to a certain extent, with some who might have voted Le Pen um, in the previous um, election. Um, but um, overall, I, I have a feeling that many will kind of be further entrenched in their position as a result of that. So it won't change an enormous amount, but it will certainly influence some undecided voters. All right. One of the novelties is, or I wouldn't call it a novelty, but it's uh, the first time in a long while where we're seeing a rematch. It was 1974. Remember 1974, the clarion call of French politics junkies. Uh, France's <laughs> first ever televised debate. It featured the center rights Valérie Giscard d'Estaing against François Mitterrand. Uh, Giscard uh, stung uh, the uh, candidate of the socialists and the communists when uh, he told Mitterrand that just because you're on the left, quote, you don't have the monopoly of caring. Seven years later, Mitterrand had definitely softened his image and used a velvet glove to hammer away at the incumbent's record. And of course, uh, Cornelia Vol, uh, that'll be a big weakness for, for Emmanuel Macron is that he'll have a record. And you, you running on a record is harder than, uh, than uh, when you're a first time candidate. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one of the advantages that Marine Le Pen now has. She is the person that uh, most uh, people feel has more radical changes to introduce. Um, we now know Emmanuel Macron as a president, and uh, he doesn't have the benefit of a doubt that he can truly change things. So he is judged on his performance in the last five years. She can still tell all sorts of stories, and people are willing to go with it because they cannot judge on that performance. But that's also the strength of Emmanuel Macron. He has the five years of performance to to put into the debate, and he can go into issues much more deeply than she is probably going to be able to do after preparing for three days, as she has said she was going to do, by intensely studying all the subjects that she, he had to work on every single day. So it's his advantage and his disadvantage. How sophisticated do you find, f not the candidates, but the viewers, when it comes to how, how superficial or how deep is it compared to Germany? Um, I don't know about comparison, but it's quite true to say it's a battle of frames. You have to be able to show yourself as somebody who is a statesman, as somebody who has uh, managed things well in the past, or what Marine Le Pen will say, who hasn't managed this. And these images are quite important. Um, I think one frame that hasn't been mentioned, of course, that Emmanuel Macron will push forward quite intensely is the proximity of Marine Le Pen with Vladimir Putin, including the funding that her party has received, which, of course, now, with the light of the Ukraine war, sheds an image that is very much to her disadvantage, and that's it's going to be something we'll hear more to more about uh, tonight. Uh, I think this is proper to all political debates in the moment where we have an election uh, in, in France, in Germany, or elsewhere. What is true is that in in proportional systems where you will have to build coalitions, you cannot shoot down the adversary because you might have to work with them afterwards in a government coalition. Here we have a setup where you can shoot down somebody because it's one against the other and one will win and the other will disappear. So the battle is different. So, yeah, and perhaps more more vociferous. Uh, and that means there'll be punchlines. We mentioned that one earlier from 1974. Uh, when it comes to one-liners, viewers on the hashtag F24 debate, well, uh, they voted for 1988. France had a power-sharing government at the time. Socialist Mitterrand was president, and his re-election rival was also his Gaullist prime minister, Jacques Chirac. Ce soir, Tonight, I'm not the prime minister, minister, and you're not the president of the republic. We're just two candidates, candidates submitting themselves to the opinion of French people. And it's for that reason that I'm calling you Mr. Mitterrand. You are completely correct, Mr. Prime Minister. You're perfectly correct, <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, Charles Masquelier, well, can there be a knockout punch like that one from Mitterrand uh, later? Oh, well, yes, we can certainly uh, expect one or more um, uh, from either side, uh, for sure. Um, what I think is particularly striking this time round, though, is that 
Um, there is a different context. As we know, someone or one of the two has been in power for five years. Um, and um, the challenges that Macron is facing, as you rightly suggested earlier, um, are the fact that he has to defend what he's already done. But one thing that I found really striking in 2017 is that there was this kind of tendency to pitch the national versus the global. And it'd be interesting to see how things are pitched in this particular debate. I mean, it seems to me that, or when it seemed to me when he gave his speech after the first round, that there was a bit of that that he might try to do. I mean, there were a lot of platitudes, there were a lot of kind of vague kind of statements being made, but there was a, a bit of that. And But I wonder whether this will still be the same, because, uh, you know, we, we now know that it's a lot more complex than just the national versus the global, um, or France versus, you know, um, the EU. It's, it's also, and still is, between left and right. I mean, here in this instance is, of course, not between left and right, in my view, anyway. It's certainly between right and right. But um, the first round showed that, you know, the left and the right are still very much there in the political spectrum. Yeah, we spent months and months, Lex Paulson, thinking that the left had disappeared. Where's the left gone? What happened to the left? And now we looked at the ballots once they've been counted on the evening of the first round, and we saw that there was a block of left-wing votes that uh, nearly leapfrogged Marine Le Pen's total. Yeah, less than 1% of the French population voting differently, 400,000 votes, and uh, it would be Mélenchon in the second round. So I, I take a slightly different view uh, than Cornelia about cohabitation. I think that actually cohabitation is very likely. I think that the voters on the left that I've talked to um, see En Marche Macron's party as a joke that's unable to, to win uh, this round of legislative elections, which means that Mélenchon, when he's talking about, I will be the prime minister uh, in, cohabit in, co in cohabitation, it's not so far-fetched. And, and so the question is, if you're a Mélenchon voter, I mean, these are the people who Macron really needs to come out and vote. Uh, up to somewhere 60, 65 percent have said they're not going to vote for Macron. So he needs to reduce that number in this debate. If you're a Mélenchon voter, which is the better scenario, having Macron as president with a, with a left coalition in parliament, or having Le Pen as president with a, with a left-wing coalition in parliament. And what Macron has to show is, with his you know, uh, commitment to ecological planning, with his willingness to, um, to talk about climate in Europe and, and, uh, and, to, and to negotiate down his retirement age, that he would be a deal-maker with a Mélenchon-led coalition. I think that's a crucial argument that he needs to signal uh, to the voters who haven't made up their minds. So Max Bégon, uh, who of Emmanuel Macron or Marine Le Pen would work better with the left in Parliament, because just to remind our viewers, it's going to be uh, four rounds of voting because we have two rounds of legislative elections that will follow in June. Which one will be better to work with the left? Sorry, which one would be better for? Which one has, has, uh, can work better with the left, Marine Le Pen or Emmanuel Macron? Well, I think uh, it would work better with Marine Le Pen because uh, there is some common policies on, um, you know, um, like the retirement age and um, also the, like, the, the, the international positioning of France, like being non-aligned as opposed to just a subject of the U.S. And um, there is also this, this uh, rejection of... Uh, a French political system owned by the, the financial system on both sides. So I think there is some ideological convergence when you put aside uh, some parts of the program. And uh, yeah, the reality is uh, Emmanuel Macron has shown in his five years of presidency that he, he didn't really work with parliament. He had uh, some people with no political experience that he put forward as candidates so that they would vote as one man uh, in Parliament and so that his power would be unchecked. And what we have seen in practice is that actually uh, a few dozens of his, of his MPs uh, have left uh, the party because they were so disappointed with the way he was doing it. So I don't think any, any party would, would want to work with Macron as a president. Well, he still has a solid majority. But let me bring in Charles Masculier on this, because what generally happens is uh, a candidate wins the presidential election and then says, you've just elected me, give me a mandate. Hmm. Yeah, yes, yes. A yeah, it's what has happened. Charles yeah. Mascudier. 
Sorry. So, so what? What can, can you specify? Can you elaborate on your question? But well, the question Sorry. is, uh, can uh, can Macron still win a majority in Parliament once it's all over if he is ah, elected? This is the thing. I mean, I don't know if you heard Mélenchon actually saying, is it yesterday or two days ago? You please vote for me as prime minister. Um, um, uh, uh, um, um, well, yeah, prime minister. That's the literal translation. Sorry, I was thinking about the the British one. But yeah, prime minister, and he's he actually means it. He means that there is still a chance, in a way, a set a third round, one could suggest, of the election there, um, and a chance for the left to gather still momentum, right, to carry on gathering momentum and potentially, who knows, to kind of do very well. There is a chance for this to happen. We're hoping this will happen, but of course, you know, it, it would it would make it very difficult. I I think for Mélenchon to work with Macron and for Macron to work with Mélenchon, uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to see eye to eye. So, I, but I look forward to this if it does happen. I mean, I, I would really look forward to to that confrontation. We had a discussion earlier in the week, Corinne Yavol, where uh, one of the panelists was saying, um, "In matter of fact, uh, there's already a coalition of sorts. Uh, Macron has, even though he doesn't have a, a party that has a long standing." He's got a big tent, and what he has is a platform that looks like a German grand coalition. Is that a fair assessment? I think it's a fair assessment because the grand coalition was the uh, center left and the center right together. And the strategy of uh, La République en marche and Emmanuel Macron in 2017 was exactly that unite the centers from the left and the right, ni gauche ni droite, and to have a movement that was a centrist movement. So we have a bit of the same. And, and I agree that we have the same. Uh, dynamics now because of the legislative election, which will be difficult uh, for Macron. He will not get the majority that he uh, is, I think, hoping for. So he will have to govern with somebody. I'm not entirely certain it will be Jean-Luc Mélenchon, even though he calls to have such a result that it becomes uh, inevitable to have him prime minister, because if it's a, par a legislative election, you could go back to the center-left parties. You have the Parti Socialiste, which is still there. You have Les Républicains, who are still there, and they can come back in the legislative election, and there could be a broader mm. coalition that he will have to work with or she will have to work with. But it's certainly not going to be um, both the presidential election and the legislative election in favor of one of the two candidates, so it will be a difficult time for both of them. It'll be a difficult time for, for, for both of them, uh, come what may. What we're also seeing is, uh, again, this, the, this block of votes that's still undecided. And it's a question of where those undecided voters uh, will go um, and whether or not this left-wing block can coalesce and bring back working class votes. Uh, we went to the Rust Belt North, once a bastion of the left, France 24's Claire Pacalin went to one town near the Belgian border that's now firmly Le Pen country. This is home ground for Marine Le Pen. Bonjour, madame. I'm Joshua Oshar, town councillor. Here's a leaflet for Sunday's election. The candidate for the far-right National Rally Party scored 49% in the first round of the presidential election. Here in the small town of Abscon, in the north of France. She'll reduce electricity and gas bills and everything else. I pay 20 euros a day to fill my car. It's no longer affordable. We're drowning here and our children will too. My son is 21 and he can't find a job. Do you think that makes sense? Don't forget to vote on Sunday. Don't worry, I will. These voters have been forgotten by Emmanuel Macron. They're not particularly interested in politics until we reach out to them. Every vote counts because whichever way it goes, the result will be very tight. The closure of factories has left a third of the population in the area unemployed. People here are convinced Marine Le Pen can keep her promise to reduce their costs of living, petrol, heating and food bills. Let's get rid of Macron. Did you vote last Sunday? Yes. For Marine Le Pen? Yes, of course. Things are really, really difficult. We are not living, we are just surviving. Gas and electricity are really expensive. It's complicated. And then there's the diesel. With Macron, we are living in misery. Once a left-wing stronghold, for several years now, Marine Le Pen has been a favourite here. But her campaigners are under pressure 
to encourage more locals to head to the polling stations on Sunday. In the first round of the presidential election, 37% of locals here didn't vote at all. So, Lex Paulson, uh, break down the math, because um, Macron to win, he's going to need some left-wing votes. Absolutely. I mean, you, you saw from, the, from that report how effective Le Pen's message is to the huge part of France that, that feels that they haven't benefited from these last um, five years. I think those are voters that Macron essentially will have very, very difficult time winning back right now, I have to say. Marine Le Pen, terrible ideas. Her election would be the end of Europe, in my opinion, but she's run a near-perfect campaign. Um, I have to give that to, to, our, to our, uh, our colleagues from the, from the national rally. Um, as you say, Macron's only... He, he, uh, basically swallowed up the socialist and Republican parties. The, they, they have got between them less than 7% of the vote. Um, socialist party doesn't really exist. A Republican party uh, of Pécresse is in 5 million euros of debt. Aren't any votes there. So who's left? So when Macron, when Le Pen tonight uh, in the debate uh, talks about cost of living, talks about increasing the pay for civil servants, for instance, yeah, yeah. what should Macron be answering? The best he can do in that situation, I think, is neutralize her on economic issues and say, again, you're not prepared, you haven't run the numbers, uh, this doesn't add up. He but says, I'm for promising example, a pay rise here. Uh, true. It's going to be tough. He needs to pivot to issues that, again, he doesn't, he's not going to get that woman's, that woman's vote. It's, it's not possible, in my opinion, as a, as a political strategist. He's going to go after the vote of people who are voted for uh, uh, Mélenchon or, or Jadot uh, or another left-wing candidate who really don't like Macron personally, but need a reason to go and vote for him, and perhaps could be convinced. That's Emmanuel Macron's only audience tonight. Not Le Pen, not the right, not the extreme right. It is those Mélenchon and left-wing voters, and he needs to get them. He needs to, he needs to reduce that number of 65 percent that are not going to vote for him down to at least 40 percent if he's going to win. I predict this election is going to be closer than five points. Closer than five points. Uh, Max Begon, uh, what should Marine Le Pen answer when you hear Emmanuel Macron later talk about uh, the record low unemployment rate we now have in France? Talk about the fact that during the COVID pandemic, France uh, had this whatever it costs strategy helping small businesses with big subsidies so that they wouldn't go under. Well, I guess it was a good strategy in terms of helping small businesses. It's a shame that... Emmanuel Macron chose a very hard line strategy that um, actually uh, forced these, these businesses to, to stay closed for very long and decided to leave uh, vaccine policy to the EU, which meant that uh, French people had their vaccines way after, for example, the English were able to source them outside of the EU. And um, in terms of unemployment, I mean, the, the answer is, is, is quite simple. It's starting to implement some economic patriotist policies. So starting when you when you decide on a free trade agreement, starting to think on the impact it's going to have on unemployment rather than corporate profits. And I think it's going to be very hard for Emmanuel Macron because he's been pushing for this free trade agreement with the US, with Canada, that are both bad for French employment and bad for the environment. Because when you bring something from like the other side, the other side of the ocean, rather than producing it in France, there is an economic, uh, there is a environmental cost. This is symbolic. I mean, and, uh, yeah, I think that's I, French voters are not going to be casting their vote based on a free trade agreement. It's it's a signaling who you're for and who you're against. This is why the right wing always has an easier time in political debates, because their frame is us versus them. In this case, we're against America. We're for Vladimir Putin. And and that's it. If you if you want to uh, cast a vote on those issues, uh, you're going to vote for, for Marine Le Pen. Macron has to break out down that symbolism and say he's for independence of France energy security uh, so that we're not paying billions of dollars to Putin's war machine. Uh, these are the issues, independence, not dependence on America, as the as the Le Pen frame goes, but rather independence and in energy, independence uh, in democracy, human rights, regulating uh, the big tech companies, which Europe is doing more effectively than anywhere else in the world. Um, these are stronger arguments for Macron. Charles Mascoulier, uh, who handled the COVID pandemic better in your view, the French or the British? Oh, it's very, very difficult to compare. And the reason why it's difficult to compare is because there's no precedent. And to be quite honest, um, it's, it's, it's such a unique situation with different kind of circumstances, with a different kind of political system, with a different economic system. So really, really difficult to to, to compare and to say, I'll be honest with you. Um, but what I would say is that I just wanted to correct one little thing um, from um, the report that was shown earlier about, um, I'm, I'm from the north, I'm from Lille myself, well, from Marcambar, which is near Lille. Uh, and I know 
you know, somehow, you know, in a way, how it is that people think and vote there, for sure. But what was particularly striking is what was missing in the report, which is the fact that Lille did very, Mélenchon did very well in Lille. Um, and uh, actually, there is still there are still bastions, left wing bastions left mm. in the north. But it's Roussel true. Roussel is from the north. Yeah. Sorry. Roussel is from the north. Fabien Roussel, the communist yeah, candidate. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and Katnaus is from the north as well. Adrien Adrien Katnaus, um, he's do, he's doing very well over there. In fact, he's doing very well in kind of taking over in some ways potentially the leadership. Who knows? Uh, we'll see whether that's going to happen. But um, yeah, so we need to remember there is still this this kind of left wing vote, and there's still the possibility of there for the left wing vote to kind of resurface in some ways. Um, but it's true that the left, generally speaking, I'm not speaking of Mélenchon here, but the Socialist Party, which brought neoliberalism through the back door, really, in France, has abandoned its own constituents, really, in many ways. And um, they can see through now the Socialist Party, who can't, you know, despite the, the you know, the, um, the, 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 the president claiming that his enemy is finance, can now see through that and actually know that uh, the enemy is not finance um, a lot of the time now. So they try to kind of find a protest vote. They try to find something that will change the circumstances in some ways. And I'm not here trying condoning that kind of movement, but trying to explain it. So what we have is basically a block, you know, that's changed away from the left towards the right and far right, I should say. And Claire Pacalin, who filed that report from northern France, uh, is still uh, in front of that red carpet uh, waiting for those two candidates uh, to arrive. Claire, your, your, your thoughts on this? Because in the report, we did see Le Pen supporters, but that was in that one specific village. Yeah, well, what's clear and what's easy to forget is that there's Lille, which is a big city, and then there are these small towns and villages where I can tell you, you'd be hard-pressed to find a Mélenchon supporter. Where I was yesterday in Abscon, he came third. In nearby Dunat, he came second, but by a long way. It's the same if you look into the eastern region of France. Mélenchon came top in Strasbourg and Mulhouse, the big cities. You go out into the countryside, though, and people are voting for Marine Le Pen. So that's why in my report that you saw, which I filmed yesterday, we were focusing on Marine Le Pen voters, because that's the people who are living in these small backwaters. It's not the same population that you have in Lille. Let me give you an update on the situation where I am now. We've seen François Bayrou and Gabriel Attal walk in, of course, supporters of Emmanuel Macron. They recently walked up the red carpet behind. We've also saw David Rachelin, a supporter of Marine Le Pen, high up in her party. He came through a little earlier, but we're still waiting for the two candidates to arrive. We think they'll be here very shortly. Claire Pacalin reporting live there uh, from uh, those television studios. Cornelia Vol, it's interesting when we break down uh, the, uh, uh, those who voted for uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the third place candidate. The reason we're talking so much about the third place candidate is because, well, the two that you're going to hear later in this debate, they're fishing for his votes. Cornelia, the, um, uh, we've had five years where on the 24-hour news channels, We've talked so much about identity politics, and a sizable chunk of those who voted for Mélenchon are immigrants who um, used to be more split between conservatives and left and seem to have voted en masse for, for Mélenchon. Is there the feeling that uh, the multicultural model which you espouse in Germany is something that a lot of French people secretly like? Because he's the only candidate of the major ones who's in favor of that. Uh, it's an issue, and I think it's one of the silent issues of this campaign. Even Marine Le Pen knows she should not, no longer talk about uh, ad identity issues and immigration uh, because her views are already well known, but it's a divisive issue. It's interesting if one looks at the card of, uh, of uh, the map of France, that the voters for Emmanuel Macron and the voters for Jean-Luc Mélenchon live in the same places. And it's the voters for Marine Le Pen who are further out, who are more in the countryside. Um, I've seen a, a graph where if you go by a kilo kilometers to a... These are live images, by the way, of Marine Le Pen arriving for the debate. Go ahead, Cornelie. Yeah, and her voters are the ones who are furthest removed. So it's now uh, it is a stake to sway Jean-Luc Mélenchon voters, and they are in the same areas and the same um, city centers that uh, the Macron voters are in. Um, they are more left, economically speaking, which is why Emmanuel Macron has to go out to get them. And uh, what let, let, Let's listen in and see if we can hear uh, the uh, far-right candidate. She says she's uh, 
Je crois que l'enjeu, c'est d'exprimer en français mon projet, le vrai, parce que j'ai euh, entendu lui, to euh, express beaucoup de choses qui ne the project, the real project. que je leur propose. Donc ce soir, j'aurai deux heures et demie. Ici, euh, euh, Charles, to say what en uh, cinq, un, deux, trois. Les Français veulent entendre. Prépare de manière particulière quand on affronte le même adversaire. Comment vous préparez quand vous affrontez le président après cinq ans Il a été cinq ans au pouvoir, ce qui n'était pas le cas la dernière fois. He's been in power for five years, which wasn't the case the last time, she says there, she, as uh, she uh, walks away. Uh, Lex Paulson, your reaction there? Um, she has been preparing for this moment for five years. Uh, by her own admission, she showed up to the last debate tired and unprepared. Uh, and Emmanuel Macron nailed her on the facts, including some very basic, easily falsifiable um, facts uh, five, uh, five years ago. It's not going to happen this time. And I sort of uh, politely disagree with, with Charles that there could be zingers. I don't think we're going to see zingers tonight. Um, I think uh, the worst thing a candidate can do, remember Hillary Clinton, um, when she said to Barack Obama, uh, that's not change you can believe in, that's change you can Xerox. And when you prepare a line and it seems very overcooked, um, the, it turns off the audience. So I think um, there's a real risk of trying to go for for a line. I think Marine Le Pen knows that she's actually in the easier position tonight. Um, she has to do what she's done throughout the campaign, which is paint this as uh, I'm a president for uh, the people, for the average worker, and Macron is for the global elite, and just say that over and over again. Um, and whereas Macron has to make a very, much more nuanced pitch um, to voters on the left who have really lost uh, trust with him, and that's a much tougher job. I think Marine Le Pen looks like um, she's ready to win this debate. So, Cornelia Val, again, this issue of, uh, oh, this campaign, it's all about identity politics. In the end, uh, that tr sort of pushed people towards M Mélenchon more than anything else. Yes. But I think one of the stakes for tonight is also to, uh, to ask the question and to put a frame that Marine Le Pen is still on the extreme right and has parts of her campaign that are closer to authoritarian uh, parties than to the democratic, liberal democracy uh, system that voters are used to, and that is something part of the left is concerned about, and this is why the Mélenchon voters, who were dividing into thirds, one-third for uh, intention votes for uh, Emmanuel Macron, one-third for Marine Le Pen, and one-third undecided, is now splitting further in favor of Macron, less so in favor of Marine Le Pen, and still a big chunk that is undecided, and that's really who needs to be targeted here. And one line is uh, to say uh, Marine Le Pen is a danger to the liberal democracy you know. Yeah, Max Begon, how will she answer when uh, Emmanuel Macron, he's sure to do it, says that she's in favor of overriding EU treaties, uh, when she uh, herself says she's in favor of uh, NATO having an alliance with Russia once the war in Ukraine is over? Peace with Putin. Well, on the EU uh, side, I will... Say it's quite easy because the French people in 2005 uh, said a resolute no to further European expansion. This was completely ignored by the French presidents that came after that referendum. So the current uh, European Union is, is not working. It's something that has been acknowledged by Macron himself. Uh, his, his suggestion is to integrate it even more, which is something the French people don't want. And Marine Le Pen is listening to the French people and instead she's proposing to hold back a little and, and give back more power to the individual nations, which when we, when we saw what happened with COVID, uh, if it hadn't been individual nations, if we're completely relying on the EU, we would be in a catastrophic situation right now. About the threat to liberal democracy, I think this is quite uh, strange to hear when you know that under Emmanuel Macron, on the Yellow Vest movement, you had peaceful demonstrators, 30 of them lost an eye from a police shot, five of them had a, a hand amputated, and 250 of them had suffered head injuries. And in 2018, the UN Commissioner for Human Rights highlighted this and asked for an investigation in, the, in this police violence. So I don't think Emmanuel Macron is the, is the one person that can say he's the defender of liberal democracy when you see how his police treats his own people. Let, let me, I'm going to interrupt you because we're, we're seeing uh, the arrival of uh, the... Uh, the incumbent in the company of uh, his wife, Brigitte Macron. Uh, Claire Pecalin, you have a closer look from your vantage point? I do. Emmanuel Macron is shaking hands now with the big wigs, the directors of TF1 and France 2, the two television channels who are organizing the debate. His wife, Brigitte, oui, alors vous le voyez encore peut-être derrière moi, Emmanuel Macron, vient tout juste d'arriver. Uh, 
All right, we're having sound issues. We can hear you saying that uh, you saw him. Uh, uh, if, I, if I heard you correctly there, Claire, saying that uh, we, we saw Emmanuel Macron uh, uh, shaking hands with uh, the heads of the TV channels that are organizing this debate. Let's dip in and see if we can hear uh, the incumbent say a few words. Bien et vous-même. Bien et vous. Ça va? Bien. Bonsoir, Monsieur le Président. Bonsoir, Monsieur le Président. Très rapidement, quel est votre état d'esprit et l'enjeu pour vous ce soir? What frame of mind are you in? I'm concentrated. Un débat qui doit nous permettre à l'un à l'autre de expliquer nos nos idées, nos projets pour la France, de clarifier aussi tout ce qui doit l'être de part et d'autre. Monsieur le Président, est-ce qu'on se prépare d'une façon spécifique quand on affronte la même adversaire cinq ans plus tard How do you prepare when it's the same adversaries five years ago Je crois qu'on se... On est conscient de l'importance de, de ce moment. Conscious of the importance of the moment. J'ai aussi à répondre de tout ce que nous avons fait durant les cinq années qui viennent. I also have to answer non, for everything that's happened in the past five years. Je vais faire de la manière la plus no, précise et honnête qui soit. I just have to answer voilà. in the most specific way possible. There you go. Balanced. Well, this is one way you know you're in France when you see a red carpet. Um, you know, in America, the candidates come and it's a big movie set, and in France, it's like it's the Cannes Film Festival. You know, before the <laughs> presidential debate. Uh, Charles Mesquelier, uh, your thoughts on again the optics of all of this? Um, the optics, um, how it's all looking um, in terms of um, well, in terms of. The optics are in terms of the results, you mean? No, just in terms of the spectacle that is this debate uh, that we're about to yes, watch. Yes, very interesting spectacle. And what I find, you know, I'm in the UK, and what I find particularly striking is how confrontational journalists in the UK tend to be to politicians. Um, much more confrontational than the French. And um, there, there, is, there has been some sort of changes in France and more confrontational journalists, certainly, um, for quite some time now. But overall, I can tell you, um, it's, 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 it's very presidential, let's just put it that way. All right, we're, we're hearing a s a still sound from the red carpet there, which uh, <laughs> I hope uh, didn't didn't perturb you. Uh, yeah, Cornelia Voll, uh, do you agree with? The, is that the assessment in Germany? Do the do the do the moderators give a, a hard time to the candidates, or is it? Uh, I, I find it striking that uh, the uh, candidates can choose who uh, the journalist is that will host them in, in, uh, in this debate. I, I don't know what the standard is. You, uh, um, you might be better informed in other countries. But um, I think it's uh, generally expected that journalists ask difficult questions, in particular in a presidential debate. But I think it's also very important that uh, once you have a duel here, which is one person against another, that uh, the um, uh, the setting is kind of stepping back and is really a discussion between two people and two ideas and two visions for France rather than uh, one particular uh, intervention by, by the journalists that are hosting this. So Because France is a very specific uh, case in Europe in that uh, we have outsized powers for the executive branch of government. And so, yeah, picking the journalists for the... Uh, <laughs> For to the, who get to moderate, and yeah, there was all kinds of haggling between mm. the two candidates. Uh, he, he, that is the difference between the likes of Germany and the UK. I think uh, when you have a presidential system where you really get this one position and it's a direct election, which other countries don't have, Germany, the, uh, the head of the state will be the one who has the majority in parliament. So those are different political systems. But when you have a presidential system where the pres president is elected in this way, then uh, you get a tendency to the television spectacle that we now see. My, my impression is it does come from the US image where you had these very televised duels which are increasingly making headway and which we now see even in countries where this was uh, totally foreign, not so much in Germany, but in other countries. So there is a presidentialization of these political debates and there's also personalization. It's not so much about parties. A lot of people don't know what the party of Emmanuel Macron is called. It's about Emmanuel Macron. It's about Marine Le Pen. I, I dare you to ask a foreign journalist what is Marine Le Pen party. I think uh, half of them will not get the name of the party exactly right because it's about people. And so the television debate is underlining that. All right. Well, it is the national rally of Max Begon. I want to thank him for being with us uh, from London. I want to thank uh, Charles Mesquelier in Exeter, Lex Paulson, Cornelia Vol for being with us. Uh, I want to thank you. And remember, we are uh, 45 minutes away from our live coverage here of that candidate's debate right here on France 24. Stay with us.